Whether your biggest cybersecurity concern is ransomware, unprotected network devices, zero trust success, or auditing your supply chains, firmware security is critical. Eclipsium's enterprise firmware security platform helps you identify devices and their firmware, verify the integrity of firmware wherever it's used, and fortify firmware throughout active remediation and automated patching. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Eclipsium to try out Eclipsium or learn more about enterprise firmware security. Wide-scale adoption of cloud applications, an increase in remote workers, and expansion of branch offices has rendered the centralized, on-premises security model impractical. Enter Cisco Umbrella. Umbrella now includes secure web gateway, firewall, and cloud access security broker functionality, plus integration with Cisco SD-WAN, all delivered from a single cloud security service. It helps businesses of all sizes secure their network and extend protection to roaming users and branch offices. Security doesn't have to be complicated. Get simple, smart, and powerful security with Cisco Umbrella. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Cisco Umbrella to learn more. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. Extra Hop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. See how it works in the full product demo, free online at securityweekly.com forward slash Extra Hop. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. InfoSec World 2021 is proud to announce its keynote lineup for this year's event. Hear from Robert Herjavec, plus heads of security at the NFL TikTok US Department of Homeland Security, Stanford University, and more. Plus, Security, list, security Weekly listeners save 20% on digital pass registration. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2021 to register now. And just a quick note, that conference has gone to virtual. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. And now on to the Enterprise Security Weekly news, which we missed a week last week, so I went a bit nuts here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, Adrian, I, I, I'd like to start with Jump Cloud. Um, Go for it. I think it's interesting if you know if you haven't read the book Play Bigger, you should definitely read the book Play Bigger. Um, Adding it to the I, list. I, I, yeah, I'm that's not sure that book. that's limited, Tyler, to any specific audience, right? Like, I just think it's a really one of the best business books out there. Yeah, it's it's a general business book that yeah. I would highly recommend. We had to read it in business school when I went through. They mm -hmm. they put it on the mandatory reading list, and it's one of those things where it's like you can get a lot out of it. As an entrepreneur, a founder, all the way up through, you know, a marketer or even someone who's building a product in a general sense, very, very yeah, valuable yeah. content. Great summary. And in that book, they talk about the category king. And when we think about directory services, Microsoft is the category king. And I'll tell you what, a very large category king in this category, right? I think there's different levels, uh, you know, as you dig into the book uh, of category kings. And how do you displace a king that has is that large and has that much market share. I think that's where Jump Cloud is going. Judging by the funding that they're they're taking on, uh, as Adrian mentioned, the top of the show, and you know, likely, w what is the second one down from a king? Like, it's it's not. Is it a prince? Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to even compare them, right? Mm. You know, because Active Directory does so many different things. It's got tentacles into so many things. It, it's so embedded within within Windows. And um, and it's hard to challenge that, you know. But one of the nice things about Jump Cloud is that they started off with the benefit of hindsight, and you know, knowing most networks aren't 100% Windows, mm. you know. So so they built it as something that could be cross-platform as well, uh, and built some additional functionality into it um, that you don't find with uh, Active Directory or isn't isn't easy with Active Directory. So it could be that then, Jump Cloud is not trying to displace the category king, we're trying to create its own category too. I kind of see a, a little bit of that at play too, that you know the most successful products, in my opinion, right, are ones that have created brand new categories. And I think that the, the, the crowned winner of that is Steve Jobs with the iPod, the iPad, and the iPhone really created yeah. three new categories. And it's pretty rare for a company uh, to be able to create three new categories and, and dominate all so, of them. So on this particular one, though, the question I have is that if we consider Active Directory as a technology that everybody's using or is the, the category king, um, 
why are the very young, very nascent companies that are up and coming coming not touching it? Like Jupiter One doesn't use it. We don't use Active yeah. Directory. At least mm-hmm. I don't think we do. Um, because it's IT horrible. Guy, but, <laughs> well, right, right. But I think the the point that's brought up around that is so innovation can disrupt, mm-hmm. um, and then a network effect is typically required for disruption of a true category king. And in the in the place of AD, I think Microsoft has missed the opportunity where they could have said, "Look, it's not just about." managing the identity within your enterprise. But look, let me give you single sign-on everywhere in every system. And I think that's where like Google and others, Google in in particular, Mm -hmm. has a chance to overthrow AD someday, right? Right. Someday. I don't think it's anytime soon, but someday. And I, I, you know, I think some of the trends we've seen, Microsoft has participated in some of these uh, trends where they've, they've kind of removed some of the necessity of, of why AD would have been so important why you would have put that in. So, you know, SaaS, certainly, you know, SSO, um, you know, everything that goes along with, um, you know, the, the, you know, ga- gaining uh, um, uh, authorization uh, from, from those types of things. And, um, and like file sync and share is a big one, you know, fi- you know, Windows file servers. Uh, when I used to train uh, penetration testers, that's the first thing I'd tell them to go after once they got credentials and they could access uh, uh, things within a- AD. Like they, I wouldn't tell them to go after domain admin first. I'd tell them to go like start sifting through file servers and things like that because almost 100% of the time you're, you're going to find stuff that really shouldn't be there and, and shouldn't be accessible to everybody within that AD forest. So so given those things as the potential disruptors of AD, does Jump Cloud target those particular innovative disrupting technologies? I'm not a huge Jump Cloud person, so I'm not sure, but I think that's really what would be required to determine whether a $159 million investment on a $2.5 billion valuation makes sense. And obviously somebody believes it. So the way Jump Cloud marketed themselves, at least early on, I haven't looked at them closely in a couple of years, um, is companies that are reaching that point where they're like, do we need Active Directory? You know, Jump Cloud wanted to be right there saying, hey, if you're, th- if you're having those thoughts, you've, you've got options. You know, we, we, we can serve some of that too. I don't know if they're going uh, uh, upscale at this point, you know, higher into the, the large enterprise market. Um, but certainly, like some products we've seen, like, uh, you know, Command, like like some of the unified device management products, you know, they're, they're bringing some of those features as well. Uh, because they're agent-based, why, why wouldn't they? You got me. So, yeah, it, really interesting to see what the exit's going to be here. Like, who, who, who wants a jump cloud? You know, VMware, you know, somebody with some kind of unified device management offering, you know, or, or maybe somebody like Okta, you know, that, that Could already it be has. Could it be Microsoft? <laughs> buy, buy it and shut it down just to uh, preserve AD revenue? I don't know. Buy it, pull in what, whatever innovative tech they've built that's differentiated and make it their own and then buy the revenue by the, by the people. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, certainly they they fit the mold uh, for I think what what an acquire would look like here. But it's I, I think it's a fun and interesting question, and I I think the answer is not something I'm going to guess. You know, like <laughs> maybe it's somebody like BlackBerry. Ooh, that that's one I hadn't thought of. But then again, I didn't think of BlackBerry's. What what did they grab? CrowdStrike was it CrowdStrike they grabbed? No, no, uh, um, Silence. Silence. That's one I was thinking of. Thank you. They grabbed Silence as a complete random shot in the dark I didn't see coming so it definitely could fit yeah yeah I mean they you know they've headed in that enterprise software direction but um, but yeah it'd be fun to hear like if anybody's got any guesses um, I I think this is this is one of the I hope it doesn't go to like a uh, um, uh, who are the ones that acquired uh, CA Broadcom? Yeah, I'm hoping Oof. it doesn't disappear into into something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I want to see them land in a, in a in a good place where they can they can actually kind of challenge AD and offer maybe a, a more secure approach. Here's the hoping alternative for that. Though I have 
I, I know some CISOs that, you know, haven't been thrilled with their security, saying that they'd at least like signed binaries and stuff like that. Hmm. Uh, and, and hopefully with this funding, you know, they can, they can tackle some of that stuff. Um, so there's a bunch of fundings here. I just want to kind of run through some of these. I'm not sure if they're all worth talking about. Um, certainly, I think some of the bigger ones are, but D3 Security raised $10 million, which was kind of confusing to me because D3 has been around for a while, and it's a small raise. Um, looks like they've been around since 2003, so maybe they're bootstrapped. I, I, I don't know if you know any background on D3 Security, Tyler. I'll be Paul. honest with you. <clears throat> for a company that's been around close to eight or nine years, um, I've never heard of them. <laughs> um, and so that either goes to one of two things. They're actually not very good at marketing or alternatively, I'm 2003, just disconnected. 2003, not 2013. Do. 2003. Yeah, 2000, oh my gosh. So that long, I, I don't know how I don't know of them, but 18 yeah, maybe years. I'm just disconnected. Yeah. And it's a SOAR platform. I've heard of them in the context of SOAR, but... Uh, Wait a minute. SOAR, yeah. SOAR platform from 2003? Is that is that such a thing? Yeah, well, they, they definitely I, made a pivot in there somewhere. Yeah, they had to have pivoted. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. Absolutely. And I think likely to pivot again um, if they're starting to take funds because I think SOAR is more of a feature than it is a, a product at this point. Although I've been proven wrong on that many times, but... Yeah, you know what's interesting here, though? It's funny. If they've been... All right, so so we don't know exactly when they went into the SOAR market, but let's assume for, for a minute they've been in the SOAR market eight years, right? Half their lifetime or whatever it is. Um, they could have potentially been one of the earliest in the SOAR market. And if they're not the dominant player, which clearly they're not if they're only taking $10 million in mm -hmm. growth equity, and $5 million of that is debt, did they miss the SOAR boat? entirely did they just just now switch into it like I, just something the acquisitions add up. have happened yeah you know yeah, that Rapid market's... 7 made their acquisition Splunk uh, made an acquisition yeah. Palo Alto Networks made an acquisition those acquisitions are all two three years old now so yeah. that, that, that boat sailed I think yeah so this leads me to believe okay if you were founded in 2003 you're still around in, in 2021 okay and let's let's assume a pivot halfway through you missed the market entry, you missed the market growth, and you've missed the market exit. Like, why are you even <laughs> playing? Very astute. Very astute, Tyler. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Uh, so Neosec, an API security startup, let, let, emerges from stealth with uh, 20 million. Yeah, I assume that's a, that, that sounds like a Series A size. Uh, but want to know how this quote hits you guys. Uh, the platform automatically finds all APIs involved with an organization and maintains a complete inventory, generating missing documentation for previously unknown APIs. I can't wait to hear both of your comments first because I have a gut feeling I'm going to be the dissenter. Yeah, I'm I, not. I'm not even making a comment. All all implies a hundred percent, and as we know, there's very few, if anything, yeah. that can claim a hundred percent. In this context, there's nothing that can claim you know accurately a hundred percent. Sure, it is possible. Technology exists to document APIs, and they they could maybe one of my guess would be one of the reasons why they're emerging from stealth with twenty million is they've gotten really good at auto generating that documentation, which is a, totally a thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what, Adrian? What's your take before I comment? I don't know. I mean, it's it's um, you know, the, these kinds of things like like same thing with AI ML uh, claims. Like, there's some legitimacy to it, you know, but the marketing just takes it too far, and and I feel like they're just setting people up for disappointment. They're they're not setting the you know, the the right expectations there. You know, I think you should set reasonable expectations and then delight people. You know, not set it way up here and disappoint. Yeah, so so my take on this one's kind of, I think I was right, a, a bit of a dissenter. I agree with Paul, the, the word all should almost never be used. Notice I used almost instead of never. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but should almost never be used in a, in a marketing statement um, for the reasons you exactly identified. You're never going to catch them all. But I think we're, for API, API security is like an area I think is, extremely important today because of the transition to cloud-based apps, the explosion of application counts, all the things that that I've been talking about for a couple of years now. And there's there's no shortage of players that do it. Salt, traceable, no name, 
um, and now and now these guys. Um, but I think what's happened is we've finally been in a position now where automated discovery of API endpoints is possible. Automated dis- documentation based off of using uh, self-defining and self-documenting uh, API definitions is possible. And so I actually think this is a really, really interesting idea. I think it's got a lot of potential. And if they do it right and market it and actually build the technology right that they're that they're claiming to have built, I'm not surprised they got 20 million because mm. I think it's uh, I think it's an area that's going to be a massive growth space in the next three to five years. It, it hits yeah. on one of those funny things like developers don't like to write. No one likes to write documentation. I mean, I, right. if you're a developer or a penetration tester, you can certainly see that as like one of the least favorite things about your job is writing documentation. There are folks out there that are technical writers that that's what they love to do. And that, and that's great. Not what I love to do. And if there's a technology out there that can automatically write that documentation for me, even if it's 80% of the way there, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, I think there's two parts to it, though, of importance, though, the discovery of what your APIs are, like mm. what you have, and mm-hmm. just knowing what your APIs are is extremely important because we're seeing such massive growth in API counts. Um, then when you talk about the documentation of them, there's two sides to documentation. There's the literal technical documentation. API endpoint X mm-hmm. requires a post or a get or a right. whatever, and these these particular uh, parameters with these, these types, right? That stuff's all, easily documentable from an automated way you can't really document the why you can't say you have to include a last name because we care about the last name of the user but you can say we require the parameter last name with a text field no longer than 256 characters or whatever you define so you can get a big chunk of the technical documentation done in an automated way but i'm more excited about the discovery of Mm -hmm. the apis and the cataloging and the tracking of them It'll be interesting to see how that technically works. And and my only request here is that when you've generated that documentation, have like a plugin or integration into Postman because that would be really handy and cool. And and keep it up to date. I can't tell you how many times I've seen an API or it's changed. And it either is documented and it changed or it changed and things broke because the documentation hadn't been updated. And you feel like you're crazy because you're doing it exactly how they yes. say to do it. Yes. Like, like m- mine looks exactly like the example. Right. Been there. Yep. Uh, BitSight raises $250 million from Moody's. This was an interesting one. And at the same time, acquires cyber risk startup Visible Risk. You know, I think I, I saw that the raise was... Uh, not a majority, but but you know, like borderline acquisition. Like like they they own a lot of BitSite now, and uh, and some of it was uh, buyout. You know that two hundred fifty million isn't all. You know for for growth and stuff like that, it's not all for them to use. Some of it was a buyout of earlier investors, mm. and uh, something like a two point five billion dollar uh, valuation for for a security scorecard type company. So interested uh in your thoughts tyler in the, in this space <laughs> yeah so bits like 400 million um 400 million total funding amount according to Crunchbase. um and what they just uh, i don't know if that includes this 250 that's a good question but um it sounds about right including the 250 i think adrian including the 250 if that 250 is a buyout of earlier investments yeah yeah kind of taking a second there yeah you know yeah, that's it's it's interesting because typically um, when when I see these larger uh, late rounds coming in, um, either the company has such massive growth um, year over year growth on a very large number, like seventy million or a hundred million of ARR, and they're hitting like you know close to 70, 80, 100 percent year over year growth. That's how you get these massive multiples and these massive numbers in play, or it's a financial engineering play where there's some kind of strategic move they want to do. They say, hey, if we if we um, can pull in 250 from, in this case, Moody's, and then take that and um, do an acquisition for 180 of it, 200 of it, you know, we end up getting accretive up to an additional revenue, you know, of, of this much in revenue that we're essentially buying into this new company. It, it can make sense just to do the math around that too. So I'm not exactly sure what the financial engineering background on this 
uh, this particular transaction was, of course. Um, but it could have been just a transaction directly to give them a small chunk, give Moody's a small chunk, and execute the acquisition at the same time. Yeah, and I think it makes sense. I guess Moody making an investment here, you know, it's um, tangential to what they do. And, uh, and Paul, we're going to test some of these products mm-hmm. here soon. So I'm, I'm interested in testing out this, this kind of concept of, you know, based on OSINT giving a company a rating and telling you how likely it is to, to get breached or have a cyber incident. The other, the other storyline here, too, is the valuation that's occurring when it comes to measuring risk and quantifying risk. Um, and, you know, that's, that's obviously the bit site storyline is the quantification and the attaching numbers to risk um, and discovering that, that risk as well. Um, so, so just that market alone, when we talk about the, the quantification of, of risk valuation or risk values, is clearly a rapidly growing market. People want to know. They don't want to know. Do I have a problem or not? Because that, I mean, they do, right? But in general, how do you handle when you have 10,000 of those, do I have a problem or not questions, and half of them come back yes? Like, what do you do first, right? It has to come down to the the quantification of the risk levels. And that's just a very difficult problem to solve. And BitSight has done a good good job of that over the years. Yeah. And saving the biggest for last, Sneak, which I had been uh, calling Sneak, but I found out founder said Sneak raised three hundred million, with so just a little bit more than Bitsight, but with a valuation that's way more than double, like more than triple, eight and a yeah, half billion. The, yeah, so this like gets re- to the financial record scratch point. sound effect. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> This gets to the financial engineering point of the other one. That's why I'm thinking the other one was potentially more of a take the investment immediately, flip it into the acquisition. Um, like, sneak, like eight sneak. and a half billion. Like that's more than McAfee and like FireEye combined right now. Or like 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 that's crazy. I mean, it's like anyone who writes software is using Snick or Sneak. Yeah. See that? Yep. Paul's got it. it they what mm-hmm. they did that won them the space wasn't actually writing the best software, although I, I can't, I, you know, their software is good, bad, whatever, it's irrelevant. What they did was they got literally every developer on the planet to sign up for their free, for their free tools. And once you have mm-hmm. access, just like Facebook, once you have access to the human being, it's all about converting them to, mm-hmm. to spend. And they have figured that nut out at least to a reasonable degree. And so when you paint the storyline of, look, you know, we have X percent of developers on the planet using our free product. If we convert 1% of them to paying or 1% of the companies that they work at to paying, we just, you know, 5x our revenue in a year. Um, and so that's the storyline. I don't know what their revenue numbers is, but I'm willing to bet their growth rate's astronomical. And mm-hmm. then when you paint that storyline of having that kind of reach, $8.5 is not crazy. Yeah. And I think their growth rate's really good because they have a good product as well. I- I'll attest to it. I've used it, tested it, and, and talked with the folks. They've got a great product, so. Yeah, I've heard very positive things mm-hmm. about the product. Um, when I generally am asked about it on um, faculty calls and other things that I do, I usually say SNCC is pretty much one of the go-tos in this space for yep. sure. And they're doing a great job of diversifying the product product yeah. portfolio, right? They used to just be an SCA tool. Now they offer SCA, SAS, DAS, you know, a whole bunch of other, um, I think even moving into QA and performance to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um and so they're just doing a great job of diversifying the product line, which lets them bring more revenue from the ones they've already converted as well. So the, the closest comparison I can think of um, here, the closest comp I can think of would be Vericode. Vericode was uh, acquired by CA for $614 million in cash. Yep. And then uh, like not 18 months later or something like that, it, it was uh, acquired again for... I think close to a billion, but just under a yeah, billion. nine and change. That's right. Yeah, so they were they they were spun back out at nine and change by was it Toma? Mm. I think it was Toma. Yeah, yeah I don't Tom, remember. Some Toma Bravo. Firm. Yeah, yeah, yeah Toma so, Bravo. Some PE firm. Um, but the, here's the thing: Verico doesn't have a. At least last I looked, I could be wrong, but I don't think they have a free tool. Certainly not with the adoption levels right. that Snick has or Sneak has. And so they can't paint that you know, that storyline of growth that sneak, sneak, sneak can paint. You know, I think they're probably closer to a 20 or 30 or 40% grower where Snick is probably 100% year over year. Okay. Yeah, that, that that's good context. 
to have. They don't have that network effect that that sneak has. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, uh, jumping around, Corelight uh, secured seventy-five million in a Series D. Um, yeah, NDR play it's been around for a while, you know, and and they they've been around for a long while. Uh, I'm not sure how old the company is, but basically they're using Zeek, and uh, their pitch has always been uh, for like uh, very high performance and and high scale situations. Yeah, I think think they even sold hardware appliances for this. Yeah, they do, and y- you can achieve some of that on your own, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot right. of it's, it's a lot <laughs> of security tuning. onion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, security onion uses Zeek and Sorakata, uh under the covers. In, in and you fact, have some recent experience with that. Uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, just rebuilt a, a sensor this morning. Um, I had to upgrade the storage on it. Back to our earlier conversation, Adrian had to put some more storage on the on the sensor, but. Uh, a lot of enterprises are using uh, Zeek, which is formerly Bro, um, and doing some of that tuning. And I think you eventually reach a point where it, diminishing returns, right? Like how how much of a trade off do you have between control and time and resources? Where you just go buy a Corelight, you know, appliance where they've done all of that tuning for you. That's where I see the value for for Corelight. We, we've worked with those folks in the past. The solid team. I want to talk about some of these acquisitions real quick. Uh, Firemon picked up Disrupt Ops, uh, a um, sponsor, Security Weekly sponsor, and uh, you know we 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 know some of the founders, some of the the crew over there from the um, uh, Tyler. Remind me on the uh, the name of the kind of analyst, Rich Mogul, uh, and yeah, Dave, uh, Rich Mogul, Dave Mike Rothman, Mike Rothman, a- Adrian sorry. Lane, yep, Securosis, Securosis. Securosis thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So um, yeah, congrats to the team. I was actually uh, talking with Rich. I want to I want to bring him on the show. Oh yeah, yeah looks like a good a a while. to have on the show for yeah. sure. Yeah, so it's interesting. Firemon's gone from this kind of single plane of glass for multiple fire firewall vendors, like managing that that stuff uh, at scale, and is now just kind of shifting up a level to to now the like the cloud and SASE level. So it makes sense. Was there a number quoted in the article um, that you saw, Adrian? No, I did not see a deal size. Yeah, so Disrupt Ops, according to Crunchbase, has eleven and a half million of total funding. Um, I am willing to bet that those those boys at uh, at Disrupt Ops, Disrupt Ops did very well on this on this play, having only taken in that amount. Mm. Something like you know, in the 150, 200 range. You think? Um, I mean, it all depends on the revenue. It's tough to know for sure. But even right. if they got, let's just assume a low side acquisition here and say they got picked up at 50 to 70, like they're happy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Seems solid. Tenable picked up Accurates. Ta- talking Acurics. about expanding. Accurix. A- yeah. I think <laughs> of it like a cure. Yeah. I, did, I had the same uh, trouble. We did some work with Accurix uh, as well. I had the same trouble with pronunciation. Um, but yeah, I, I think it represents a good uh, kind of pivot in innovation for Tenable, uh, which is we've observed on the show hasn't you know deviated too much from that VM uh, kind of play compared to Qualys uh, and Rapid Seven. Certainly compared to Qualys, I mean Qualys has you know taken over lots of market share in different categories, uh, or at least trying to in their product offerings. Um, but you know for Tenable, this I think really fits with Tenable. Right, and then more sheer kind of VM approach. Discover the vulnerabilities in your uh, infrastructure as code. Uh, it fits with their narrative. Check all your YAMLs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ch- Checking your YAMLs. You got uh, people got YAMLs all over the place, so they they all need to be checked. So, so Paul, I don't know if you know this about about Acurix or not. Um, you know, I have I have limited exposure to them, but. When you look at the website, it's things like infrastructure is code, security is code, remediation is code, drift is code, everything is code. Are they scanning the code versions and thus the YAML discussion, or are they actually connecting to your infrastructure in real time and looking what you have out there that's running? Uh, doing both and making a comparison. Oh, super interesting. Yep. Oh, great. So they're doing delta between the yes. two. That's a really good idea. Because you know what, what you're writing in code can oftentimes differ from what you have in production. And I, when I saw the demo, I'm like 99.9% positive that was one of their like big points was that's running in production and it's vulnerable and maybe you've solved it in development or vice versa, right? 
Yeah, Don't no, they that's, also that... have an open source product uh, for for scanning Terraform as well? I thought I'd seen I that. They, I think they do have something that you can use for free. I don't know if it's open Terascan? source or not. Terascan. Yeah, it sounds like it. Terrascan for yes. yeah, yes, Terrascan. That's that's very cool. That would be cool to check out at some point. Um, really big acquisition, uh, and you know, in, in in the vein of uh, Security Weekly sponsors getting acquired, Newstar for three point one billion going to TransUnion. It's yeah. a big one. It's a big one. We're seeing more and more acquisitions with that letter B. It's kind of crazy. And, and, and more going into so this is a credit agency, but you know Moody's. You know we we've seen. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, one of them in here. I, I, I wasn't even going to talk about. Uh, you know was was. Uh, um, yeah, you know, incident response companies we've seen go into insurance companies and and uh, consulting firms. Booz Allen picked up a uh, incident response company. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. A lot of a uh, lot of mainstream acquisitions, you know, where there's, uh, uh, you know, some kind of benefit of, of, you know, certainly for an insurance company providing cyber insurance, you know, it's more cost effective to send out your own IR crew for a breach, right? Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting, you know. But when you're starting to put B's in front of the in front of the numbers for acquisition size, you know, at what point yeah. does it get smarter to build it yourself? Well, I mean, New Star is, I think, a no-brainer. They've got all kinds of, uh, like, they own huge amounts of IP infrastructure. Like, they've got root-level domain. They like dot New Star is a thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're yeah. they're big registrar. You know, like like they they've uh, got a lot of this original internet, um, uh, you know, land. You know, kind kind of uh, property high property value land that they're sitting on. Yep, they've been around a long time doing a lot of different things too. Yeah, I had a few. Ex- I w- DDoS protection that was that was new star, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if you yeah, they were if you're a large enterprise and it's super important that you be resilient, a new star is is the choice. That's basically what you know their positioning was in the market, right? If, if you need to pick up the phone and call someone when you're in an incident and get someone that knows exactly what is going on and how to help you, that's where you want to go. A lot of companies yeah. will offer that as like an add-on service, but New Star is like, no, we're like the the red carpet, like you get a person on the phone kind of thing. Yeah. If you know a large financial that you can't be down because of a DDoS, they're they're in a very short list of those vendors that can soak up like yeah ter- terabit level DDoS mm-hmm. attacks and and ha- handle yep. like the really big stuff at scale, like them, Akamai, you know, and maybe a few others. I can't think of right now. Uh, I threw a few executive moves on here. I thought it was interesting. Martin Roche, uh, I think that's how you say it, joined uh, Netography. So the guy that created uh, Snort and created Marty Resch. Uh, Resch, created Sourcefire, uh, was at Cisco for a while. And I don't know if he can be credited with kind of making Cisco into a security company, but certainly it was after the Sourcefire acquisition that I started to see Cisco as more of a serious player in the security space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely been a series of acquisitions over the last, I don't even know now at this point, about 15 years or more, or whenever whenever Sourcefire, they were kind of the the early acquisition to put um, to put Cisco on the map. But, you know, there's been a number of acquisitions over there, including um, there was a big cloud, cloud one, and then there was Duo, mm-hmm. and then there was Sourcefire. There's a handful of them that were basically just made Cisco what they are today and and they're still going right they're still super active uh they mm-hmm. have a lot of cash balance on the books and they can do a lot more of these big plays yep yeah and uh two that kind of go together uh the other exec move was uh palo alto networks grabbing bj jenkins who is the ceo of barracuda networks uh big uh channel sales guy uh brought them over for that and palo alto entered the consumer market uh with a a new brand called Okio. Yeah, I feel like you we know, could talk about that one for for a long time. That second one there, um, you know, with the shift to work from home and the pandemic, I think obvious this is an obvious play for them to compete with Cisco and and some of the Meraki stuff that they do. So, 
definitely think it's an interesting move for them to continue to extend into the home network. Yeah, it any is, others? Uh, it's interesting how hardware would play out in that in that scenario. I think a lot of companies are hesitant to ship more than one or two devices to everyone. Right? I think that's really so, what it comes down to. I mean, because Aruba had that um, back in the day as well. I mean, I remember testing Aruba yeah. devices and be like, you you carry this around, and that's you know your VPN kind of uh, endpoint and protection for when you're traveling, and it's your access point and whatever so i don't think going it's going to be a traveling scenario i don't think mm. people are going to ever want to carry a box period at least you know the vast majority of people maybe the super high risk might be required to but the vast majority of traveling employees probably won't i think this is just a play to be in the home yeah and and how does the yeah. enterprise now end into the home and that's the question so it, it, this is something that's come up a lot in my enterprise uh, past where I, I remember um, back in 2006, 2007, I actually had a, a, a Cisco VoIP phone and a Cisco, little tiny Cisco ASA device, mm -hmm. you know, that, that automatically created a tunnel in, into work. And then I, I could four digit dial people in Poland or in right. Spain or in Ireland at, you know, any, any of our places where we had the, the telephony integrated. Uh, internationally, uh, which is really cool. And then uh, more recently in the enterprise, like we were having trouble justifying like a PA200, like like some of the UTM devices that you, you know, Meraki's maybe in the $800 to $1,200 range for our branch offices that just had two or three uh, employees and they're, they're really sales offices. And um, so I, I think this brings it down at three hundred bucks, um, and you can kind of add on some additional services for an extra hundred bucks. Um, you know, I think this starts to make sense for connecting that enterprise network to those smaller offices into the homes. And I think the other side of this is with the pandemic. You, you know, like we we just can't pretend anymore like enterprise stuff isn't happening on home networks right. behind eight-year-old Netgear routers with default crits. Mm -hmm. That's actually the only place that's happening now. Like the vast yeah. majority <laughs> of the place that's happening now. And, and we shouldn't be comfortable with that. But then you've got kind of a privacy playoff there, right? Like I remember the first time we tried putting, uh, you know, stuff like, uh, well, I won't name names, but uh, MDM software on people's personal phones few people's phones got accidentally wiped and they didn't have backups of mm -hmm. their personal data on those phones. And, uh, and it, it really kind of soiled the, the whole idea of, of trying to do that in the enterprise uh, for a lot of employees. And they said, you know what, you know, if you want MDM on my personal property, uh, you can just buy me a work phone and I'll carry two phones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't. I don't think. I, I mean, that's fairly easy to do technically. A little bit more difficult to create two networks in somebody's home. Yeah, well, because then double natting is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, there's all out there. My of, my experience in networking, double natting is not where you want to be. Yeah, like if I still need a printer, what side of it does it yeah. go on? Like, like it gets into some really mm -hmm. nitty gritty details there. But I, I think at the very least, if it helps individuals with their own security I, I i think it's i think it could be pretty successful and that's something the the av companies actually did a while ago like like uh that was a big thing like realizing hey if you want to protect employees you have to protect them on all their devices not just on their work devices so back in like 2015 av companies uh for them a single license um, was uh, like five devices or something like that. They started going to this model where they would en encourage you to encourage your employees to take that Webroot license. Webroot was one of the first companies that did this or, or you know, uh, Malwarebytes or whoever and install it on your home stuff as well, not just your work stuff. You know, so it's almost kind of like a, a company perk in a way. Yep. Um, I think I'm going to skip some of these other ones and uh, go to the go to the squirrel of the day here. So this is the, kind of a, a, a non sequitur, you know. Like uh, I was saying before, uh, we we started uh, broadcasting live. Uh, one of my favorite things about uh, some of my favorite newsletters 
are the non sequiturs that have nothing to do with what the newsletter is about. They're just fun stuff that that you kind of throw on the bottom. And this is something where, like, I've been a Jurassic Park fan, I think, since uh, since the book came out, since I was a teenager. I remember going to see the movie. And uh, a biotech startup is talking about bringing back extinct animals, uh, uh, specifically a woolly mammoth, and, like, creating a... Uh, uh, <laughs> a herd of mammoths and dropping them in Siberia. I'm just laughing because there's, there's. If you're watching the video, there's squirrels on the the stream right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, excellent. Literally squirrels. It's awesome. Yeah, that, oh, that's so amazing. Thank you, Johnny. Sure that, they're making sure that Johnny's making sure that each of us have screen time with the squirrels so that you right. do screenshots. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, the real question, Adrian, that I have about this story. Is didn't they see the damn movie? It doesn't end well. Right. It doesn't end well. And and they're they said they were gonna be at the embryo stage where they'd be ready to put a woolly mammoth embryo in an elephant and and you know, by 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 now, but you know, it's one of those like moving three year deadline type goal things. So they're not quite there yet. But it seems like the technology's there and it's possible, so you know what, what was what was the Ian Malcolm quote? It was uh, you're so preoccupied with uh, with getting it done that you didn't think should it be done. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's a paraphrasing. Obviously, it was why. said much better in the movie. The real question is the why. Absolutely, should this be done? And we could go down that ethical rat hole for a long time now. Yep, extinct animals. <laughs> the company's mm-hmm. name is Colossal. Great. Sounds very uh, Jurassic to me. <laughs> the, the, the puns just write themselves. Just <laughs> exactly. <all> <laughs> it's a mammoth project. <laughs> Colossal taking on a mammoth project. <laughs> oh, wait, that was the third or fourth movie. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Oh, my God. All right. Th- this has been amazing. Um, feels weird to say it, but. Thanks so much, Tyler and Paul, for joining me today. It's it's kind of a weird switch. And a big thanks to everyone for watching or listening to this week's episode of Enterprise Security Weekly at Home. 